I remembered him from being a street dealer, one of the many. My drive and the draw towards it was to make money and began to deal my first batch of drugs when I was about 13 years old. I'll see guns, I'll see machetes, I'll see all these drugs play out in front of me. It was the darkest period of my life. And I just didn't want to live anymore. I was banging on the door and all that, calling out to him, but he wasn't answering. I do remember grabbing him up, like walking him around, smacking his face, telling him to wake up. Tony, don't do this to us, Tony, don't do this to us. And that was right there my epiphany, that no one saw me praying the day before, asking God for a sign. And here I get it in black and white. God uses us to reach those that are out there. Because you know why? When they come in, do you know what they feel? They feel love. If it wasn't for his religion and his faith, he would either be in jail or dead. So young Tony looking at me now would never dream or thought I'll be doing what I'm doing now. Started, eh? Guys, my name's Tony. Just on the onset, guys, uh, 20 years ago, I was in right in your shoes, man. I was locked up in this centre. Tony Huang is passionate about telling his story, to warn young men not to make the mistakes he once did. Basically, I'm going to take you through my journey. I'm going to drag you through my life. And so the hope is, is that actually you begin to think about your own life, right? Because I ran with a gang for about a year doing stupid things, doing things that I wouldn't normally do when I'm alone. You know, after school, go and do home invasions and all these other things that, listen, I'm not proud of today. I did some, some wicked things. But I look back here, it's like, hey, I didn't, I didn't know any better. I wasn't instructed any better. Eventually, I ended up dealing drugs to undercover copper at Cabramatta Station. And two months later, here I am. If you notice, I grow two centimetres. <laughs> It felt really good going back to Cobham because I'm on the right side of the fence, knowing that I'm coming in and I'm going out. But just to know I have that connection with the young people, because I start off saying to them that I know where you're coming from. Tony's parents were refugees from Vietnam. They arrived in Sydney with three girls and Tony was born soon after. His mum and dad worked long hours to create a new life in Australia. But their trauma from the war and constant financial stress led to an unstable and sometimes violent home life. Growing up, it was difficult being in a refugee home. Mum and dad was always working, so it was not much, I guess, interaction with my parents. You know, guys, we didn't grow up with much. And my father used to beat me up when I tried to make toys at home because I, you know, I, I'll make a mess. And he'll beat me up and he'll say these words to me in Vietnamese. He would say, Mình ngu yung jo. You know what that means? That you're, you're, you're dumb as a dog, you're stupid. You never mount up to nothing. He was the only boy in the, the family. He was soft-hearted. He was kind-hearted. Communicating with people, mum, dad, with ourselves, caused him a lot of like anger inside because he couldn't express himself. I think the tough memories would be just um, seeing dad drink a lot, which would cause um, arguments between mum and dad. And I think as kids, we don't know what's going on. We just hide it, hide in our rooms. Well, even um, seeing dad hit mum and all that too. Like we were exposed to that at a young age. Every single one of my siblings ran away, and including myself uh, at a very young age. My parents did their best to keep me in school and give me an education, but we didn't have much, and so I had a lot of hand-me-downs. So I remember distinctively in year seven, I wore my, uh, wear, I wore my uncle's shorts that were oversized, and it looked like a skirt. 
and I got teased. And they called me Tony Skirt. Tony Skirt at the, at the train station on the way home. Something rose up in me and, I, and so I, I, I bashed the guy. And so I think from then, I was just like, I'm not gonna get teased. Which is from there, things begin to escalate. I got expelled from four different high schools. I would extort people. I want 10 bucks a day, if not, I, I'm gonna bash you. I very quickly joined the gangs in Cabramatta, got involved with people and, you know, doing things that I wouldn't normally do on my own. Cabramatta was a place like no other I'd worked at. It had a heartbeat. It was colour and movement. It had probably, in a way, the best and the worst. It had um, people making their way, embracing a new country, wanting to, to move forward, wanting to be prosperous. They were friendly, they were engaging. And then of course you had the underside of that, which was the drug trade. Death and violence are now a way of life in Cabramatta, and the business of heroin rules the streets. Cabramatta was once famed as Australia's multicultural triumph. Now, though, the town is famous for just two things, the murder of New South Wales MP John Newman and heroin. Their normal day would be sirens, people dealing drugs, and it wasn't hidden, it was out there. In 1995, Deborah Wallace was a young detective working in southwest Sydney. She was put in charge of a localised gang unit called the Cabramatta Gang Squad. I remember the article, it was a double page spread and it had Smack Express and it was about the trains coming loaded with people to Cabramatta because they had released the purity and the price. So all roads led to Cabramatta. Cabramatta back in those days were ruled by the Vietnamese gang. They were feared, but they were honoured and respected. And as a little kid, seeing that there is a group, there is brotherhood, there is family, that's what a young kid wanted. We desired to be a part of that. You looked up to that, especially if you had come from a broken home. You idolised that. They often were the boys that the families could afford to send to a new opportunity to get them away from the war, to South Vietnam prison camps. So um, when I'm trying to think of what I could do, I thought um, maybe the best people to teach me what strategy would work would be the gang members themselves. Did we ever actually ask them? Probably a bit naive at, at, at the time. I just said to the senior members that were left, so guys, I've got to break you up. They laughed. And then they said, you know, madam, we'll give you some hints. They sort of said, look, we're lost. Don't worry about us, we have to make our way, you'll do your bit, your group will try to catch us, we'll try to not get caught, we'll all work in harmony, so to speak. That's the, you know, the, the law of the land. But the real difference will come from the next generation behind us, because there's young kids now, 13, 14, who are seeing us as role models, so you have to challenge that, you have to break it, because, madam, what you're doing is cutting the grass, but you're not treating the weeds. Started 30 years old, before and after school, I'll be here. We'll all be here, surrounded by school students everywhere. And um, we'll, some of us will be dealing drugs uh, before school. And so it would be hard to spot us who the dealers were. And so, you know, customers will get off on the train. And if you're Anglo, uh, you're a potential customer. And so we'll come and say, hey, you're right. And most of the time, they've come in here for a reason. And uh, most of the time, it's to pick up drugs. And so we'll do the deal take them around the corner, swap the money, give them the gear, and end the story. The first time I got caught dealing drugs was at Cabramatta Station, where I, I, uh, I dealt drugs to an undercover police officer. And uh, I did the deal, he walked off, and uh, while I'm walking up the ramp to go away, uh, they came back with another two and uh, grabbed me kept me up against the fence and, uh, and just arrested me. So I was um, 13 years old. And I remember, um, you know, well, here, here he starts. Here we go. I was afraid that he, was, he wouldn't be able to handle it. And yeah, I was just scared for him. I used to, I remember thinking to myself, oh, I wish I could take that up for him and do the time for him. 
when I first heard that Tony got into that drug lifestyle, I was very angry and upset. And I think I wanted to, like, take my anger out on who he was trying to hang out with and blame them and things like that. And as an older sister, going through those things... Sorry, I'm just going to cry. There was two sides of me. There was one, I wanted to come out and make mum and dad proud and just do right. But on the other side, I just wanted to prove that I didn't need anybody. I just wanted to come out and make money. That's what I did. In his teens, Tony spent years in and out of youth detention. Before he even turned 20, he was dealing large amounts of heroin. I moved out of home. I had two drug houses going on. And now I'm pushing more weight and I'm making more money. By 16, 17, I was making seven to 10 grand a week. Until I came to a place where I lost so many friends by 21 years old, I just had enough of my life. So left to my own thoughts, became depressed, and I tried to commit suicide at 21. His door was locked, and um, like we knew he was in there, but I was banging on the door and all that, and calling out to him, but he wasn't answering. And um, I don't know, we just called out to him several times. There was no answer, and then... How did we get in? We, we got into the room somehow. I think we climbed through the window or something. Yeah, and he was lying on the bed, just arms out, um, unresponsive. I try to block it out. It's, um, yeah. You know, I, I, straight, I can't really remember how... I do remember grabbing him up, like, walking him around, smacking his face, telling him to wake up. Tony, don't do this to us. Tony, don't do this to us. And we were crying and screaming. And he somehow came through. I can't, can't even remember how he, he came through, but... Oh, just thinking about it, my heart's pumping, eh? But that was one uh, very scary moment. So I thought we lost him. I knew, I knew I had to change. And it's in that period of time, I, I just cried out to God. So I came to a point, I just had enough. And I went to my church when I, no one was around. I got down on my knees and I began to weep. And I said to God, I said, if you died for me, for me to live like this, then I don't want to live. But if you were real, then I need you to make yourself real to me. And please just give me a sign. And I got up and I went home and uh, with some sort of relief. But it was until the next day that I was walking through Cabramatta. And it was right there, I was handed a flyer that read, if you're looking for a sign from God, here it is. And that was right there, my epiphany. No one saw me praying the day before, asking God for a sign. And here I get it in black and white. That was on the 8th of February, 2004, that I gave Jesus my life and I haven't turned back. I thought crazy. it was bullshitting at first. <laughs> no, I didn't take him seriously. I thought he was crazy. Yeah, um, cause like, he used to have like two puck pictures like all these rap CDs. He took everything that wasn't godly, which was everything, out of his room. <laughs> and um, I came down, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You know, because he was just cleaning up his whole room. And he was just chucking everything. Oh, I don't need all this stuff no more. And he was putting up all these scriptures. I just didn't think, because not much people, like, have that big turnaround from a drug habit full-blown drug habit, drug dealer, going through fast, easy money, to leaving that all behind, to turn to something that's not even there. Like, turn to your faith. I think that's the time where it was speaking in tongues. Yeah. Um, my dad just didn't want to hear it, didn't want to understand, and just went off at him. And Tony just turned around and just started pacing up and down praying from the top of his lungs, you know, just, God, help me, help, help my dad understand, like, just praying out loud. 
And I was like, pretty, whoa, shocked, you know, like, are you serious? <laughs> I guess in the beginning it was very troubling for people. You know, my wife thought I was brainwashed. My friends were thinking I've gone crazy. He's gone all religious, you know. Um, but in, a, in time I said, you know what, you, you would see that this change is real. Today, Tony works as a Pentecostal pastor in Western Sydney. So as a church and as a pastor of the church, my call is to love people and support and help people get to where they need to be. I met Tony when I was in the rehab restoration centre. I was like drinking almost every day for about almost 17 years. And then I had two seizures, almost died, and I still didn't stop until I went to jail. Tony came and spoke to, um, came and spoke at the rehab and yeah, he just spoke about his life and um, how he changed. Just his story captured me, um, it was the rawness of it. And then when he, he told his story, I could tell he was the real deal. I made new friends here, so I'm not hanging out with the old people at the pubs. Before I had nothing else. So now I had something else to help me with my addiction. And the more happy I was, the more grounded I was in my faith, my addiction started going away slowly. Maybe you're a backslidden tonight. God sees that hand. Maybe you're a backslidden tonight. You want to come back to God. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. That's you tonight. Come back to Jesus. Don't, don't let it drag on any longer. One last time, backslider, unsaved, would you come to Jesus? Lift up your hand. Nice night. God bless you. Man. We're not perfect. No one is. And the church is definitely not perfect. And so many people try to shop around for the perfect church. And the saying is, once you find one, don't join it because you'll wreck it. So, you know, in life, it doesn't matter how disadvantaged you may feel, how unequipped you may look or feel and understand and think about how your history is, right? Whether you're disadvantaged, listen, we're all disadvantaged. But if you will focus in on the very thing that drives you, right? Listen, you can run your race, man. You can cross the line. You can be who you need to be. If you're disciplined enough, and you make the right choices and decisions in life. Guys, that's all we have. As well as giving talks at juvenile justice centres, Tony also visits rehab clinics and schools. He formed a program called Inspire 180 to demystify the lure of drugs and the gangster lifestyle. Yes, yeah, so Inspire 180 started uh, simply for the reason of my own experience in high school. So if I had someone to come in while I was in high school saying, hey, been there, done that, these are the choices you're making and these are the consequences, then maybe, just maybe, I would have made the right choice. So young Tony looking at me now, I would never dream or thought I'll be doing what I'm doing now, right? To have the impact or even to speak the way I do, because I never was a speaker, I was very shy. And, but to look at me now, it just blows me away. Now, the first time I heard him say a sermon, I was like, <laughs> when did he learn those <laughs> words? Oh shit, did he go back to school or something? No, I was shocked with the yeah type of words and how he was putting his whole sermon together. I was shocked. Because like Yen said, he couldn't even put like a sentence together, <laughs> let alone a whole um, sermon. But uh, yeah, we've seen the big change in him and we we're happy and proud yeah. for him, eh? If it wasn't for his religion and his faith, he would either be, from my point of view, in jail or dead. Recently, Tony and Deb met again at a juvenile justice centre where they were both speaking about how to break out of the criminal cycle. At first, Deb didn't recognise Tony. I went, why does he look familiar? And I'm starting to think, wow, he would have been, and I'm trying to work out the ages, and then it twigged. I remembered him from being a street dealer, one of the many. But he had um, a baby face uh, way back then, and I still remember that he still had these really youthful looks, although he moved on and achieved so much. He came up and says, Madam, do you remember me? And then I said, I do. It's often asked when we do, especially in the world of crime prevention, do we think people can change? I absolutely do believe that. We can tell them all day as cops, as people in authority, don't do this, don't do that. Does it mean much? Hopefully, it gives them an aspect, gives them the con we talk about consequences if you go down that. 
I find Tony's story and others like Tony, this is what we are, this is what we did, do not look up to us. Use our story as a deterrent, not as role models. Very powerful. I would describe my life now being full. We're working with people, helping people, and uh, you know, trying to juggle family and being a husband, a father, you know, a community leader. And that's such a blessing to actually do what I do. It's a privilege. A few years ago, Tony finally tried to reconcile with his dad. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm a father myself. And I guess it came to his point of opportunity to let my father know that after everything that he's done, that as a man to man, I forgave him. And in a sense, asked him to forgive me for not being a good son. And I think um, at that point, we started our relationship again, which didn't last long until he passed away. Yeah, well, so there's no words to describe what kind of man he is now. And when I see Tony now, straight up, everyone knows him and I get proud when people say, oh, you know, I've met your brother and um, I know your brother, I've seen him, you know, I've, he's done this and that for me. But it's like just that proud feeling. And that's where my desire and passion comes from, is to make a difference, to give back what I've taken from Cabramatta. And I think it's going to take my lifetime, but if I can inspire just one person to do the same, I think the impact will continue.